Guten Morgen, Dobriden, uh, and good morning and good day. Um, I'm here to talk to you today about rethinking open source identity management software and really just talking about the past, present, and future. So, who am I? Uh, my name is William Brown. I'm a senior software engineer as part of SUSE Labs. Uh, I'm based in uh, Queensland, Australia, which means that I'm quite far away. So the best way to get in contact with me, given that I live in UTC plus 10, is going to be to send me an email. You can't see the email because it's not on screen, but it is wbrown at suza.de. Now, online, uh, generally for my work, I work on 389 directory server, which is a, an LDAP server. Um, and we generally compete against uh, open LDAP. 389 is the, the uh, LDAP server pro uh, code that gets turned into Red Hat Directory Server and also we use in SUSE. So it's used around the world in a lot of places. Um, but today I'm not here to talk to you about my work on LDAP servers. I'm here to talk to you today about different things. And while I was at Samba XP, uh, I gave a talk there about using Samba 4 as the default LDAP server because everyone has this, this idea in their head about I want one single service that holds all of my identities, the one true source of um, security. And so people have looked at things like LDAP, or you know, as I was talking to Richard yesterday, people tried things like the whole golden triangle with AD and LDAP and Mac and things like this. So I asked at Samba XP, what's next for open source IDM? And you know, there's a lot of things we can do at the moment with things like 389 or Samba 4 to bring in and make compatibilities for Unix clients and to get Windows machines working and a whole bunch of other stuff. But we still need to be looking towards the future because a lot of these are all old technologies. So when we start talking about what that, uh, what is next for open source identity management, we really need to think about what are the trends in computing and what are the trends in especially identity management and, and that area of security, which is really important. And the main one, like there's, there's a number of things that are going on. And I think one of the most important ones is that as an industry, and especially within security, we are finally starting to acknowledge that humans exist and they interact with our software. Who would have thought? And, and that's really important because once we start to think about the fact that humans are using our technology from all walks of life and very diverse backgrounds and different skill sets, we can now have conversations about the psychology of those people and how they actually interact with systems and how we can design systems where people don't make mistakes. Because if you make a mistake when you're interacting with a system, maybe it's the system that's at fault. You've all walked into a door that said push, not pull. You're not stupid. The door is badly designed. We need to start taking the same attitude to computers. And what this leads to is the fact that the next trend that we're really seeing is the end of human interaction with passwords. We are starting to see people starting to push password managers a lot more. It's becoming a much uh, bigger topic inside of web browsers. We're seeing... Um, you know, better integration with those password managers with web browsers. And we're also starting to see uh, companies push away from people interacting with passwords. So you shouldn't be memorizing all your passwords. You should have your um, passwords in those key managers. But we're also starting to see things like multi-factor auth, and we're starting to see cryptographic auth. So here we're talking about things like YubiKeys, which I have one in my laptop. Some of you may have them as well. We're talking about authentication where you don't know what the details are. It's something you have. And this really steps us to the next point, which is that our, the way that we interact with computers is changing as well. So we're starting to see um, that HTTP-first APIs are really the most important thing for protocols. And we're going to see the end of custom client protocols in our lifetime. We, um, a lot of things now are being implemented with HTTP as the first. Everyone's just staring at the projector while I, I'm on the live stream. It's very distracting having two of me. <laughs> I, okay, I swear that the third point will appear in a second. That's how we'll know how much delay there is in the stream. But Hang on, have I checked? Uh, anyway. Anyway, we'll see. There's nothing that's too... There's nothing that needs too much for, um, uh, for you to see on the slides. It's just supporting material. So anyway, HTTP first. Um, 
these days, we're not seeing people develop new protocols. We're not seeing people develop another ASN binary protocol. We're not seeing port allocations in Etsy services. We're seeing people do HTTP first protocols. But not just that, applications are all web first. We're not seeing thick clients being developed much more. We're seeing a lot of web applications. And so where this leads is that we're actually seeing whole programming languages that aren't even developing some of these APIs. Rust, for example, does not have an ASN library, which means it's not possible to write an LDAP library in Rust today. And, and this is you know, really telling of the direction where we are moving in computing. And the final part, uh, which is that devices are now part of your identity. These are unable to be taken away from you. They are part of who you are. Your phone, for example, is part of your identity. And soon it will hopefully be used as part of the way that you interact with services. So your, you will authenticate to your phone, and then it will continue to authenticate you on your behalf. And we all have this model in a way already. On your laptop, you have SSH keys. You log into your laptop, you have authenticated to that machine, and now your SSH keys continue to authenticate you. This is a trend that will be brought more broadly to people outside of just tech. So before we get into the whole history of things, with these trends, today I'm actually talking about one of my side projects and what I'm doing and, and why I thought it was time for something new. So I've been working on a new identity management project for the last year in my free time and a little bit sometimes my SUSE Labs research time. And uh, you can't see the very cute crab logo yet with a, with a passport, you'll see in a second. Um, and it's named CunnyDM. And, and the whole point of this project is that I wanted to write something that was modern, understood these trends, and was developed with a framework where we could continue to extend it for managing trends that we haven't preempted yet. I don't want to be continually hand-tied by the issues that we have in our past. And I really want it to be extensible for various needs and really secure by default. Now, I will caveat this. It's still under a huge amount of development. I'm literally writing the indexing code at the moment so that searches don't take like half a second. I'm still writing it. I don't expect to have something you could deploy at home before early 2020, but I'm getting ready to be able to deploy this for my Radius infrastructure at home and, and go from there. So the obvious question here, given that my manager is sitting right there, is why would you do this? You work on 389, you work on an LDAP server, why would you write something else? All right? It just seems like I, I'm self-defeating at every possible opportunity. He, my manager just said I'm crazy. Apparently, yeah. Look, let's, so in order for me to like, talk about why I decided to do this, we need to look at the history of identity management. Um, so what you're missing out on is you're missing out. I actually spent a lot of time making a beautiful timeline in OmniGraffle, and, and you're missing out on it now. So you'll see it in a few seconds. So all right, let's talk about it. Identity management actually has a lot of history, and there's a lot of stuff that went on. So in 1982, the password file was added to BSD and Solaris. And this is kind of where a lot of stuff really uh, starts in terms of the way that we think about the APIs where we interact with, you know, get in for getting users and groups and things like that. That API really hasn't changed since that password file was introduced. And the format of how we format users in LDAP is still modeled around this structure. In the 1980s, MIT Kerberos was started with Kerberos version 4, and this came out of Project Athena, and the entire point of this was that um, they wanted a, a way of transmitting uh, credentials on a network that were encrypted without needing to send passwords. Because this was before we had very prevalent deployments of TLS. Cryptographic operations were expensive. We don't want to use those CPU cycles. So also in the 1980s, the X500 standards were introduced by the International Telecom Union. Now, this one's really important because this is where directory access protocol came in, as well as things like X509 certificates. And this is one of the precursors that led to all of your certificates having such a similar syntax to LDAP, like your CN and your OU and things like that. The ITU envisaged a worldwide, you know, federated identity system where everyone could share and exchange identities, and it was all modeled off of this hierarchical system. So also in the 1980s, NIS, or Network Information Services, was introduced by Sun, and this was obviously in response to the need that 
you needed to have centralized auth when you're deploying lots of workstations. You can't keep managing files at scale. Like, we've worked out how to do it now, but we didn't have that back then. And this was very quickly followed in 1992 by the deployment of NIST Plus with Solaris 2 to improve some of those things. Now, in 1993, we see Kerberos version 5 replacing version 4 of MIT Kerberos, and version 5 of Kerberos is what you know today. And in 93, we also see NetWare directory services being created. And NetWare was really important because it had this idea of using not only the directory as like a single source of configuration for servers, but later on, Novell went on to be you know, the, the major player in Windows desktop authentication, and that inspired future events as well. SSH v1 was invented in 1995, and in 97, we probably have one of the most interesting developments. People at University of Michigan were so sick of DAP, right? It was a train wreck to work with. It was really difficult, really complicated. No one could figure it out. So some people made a proxy, and they called it the Lightweight Directory Access Pro Protocol. And it was meant to make the entire thing much easier to use, but still connect to this DAP server behind. And within one year, no one was using DAP as a protocol. Everyone was using this proxy. And that proxy became the Open LDAP project. And those, that became the LDAP standard, and it basically completely wiped out X500 DAP within a year. And that has, and, and of course, the Open LDAP project then pivoted from being a proxy to now actually being the data store that stores that information. So in 99, the Free Radius project was founded, and Free Radius is, of course, pretty important. This is how all Wi-Fi authentication happens in terms of the challenge response for Wi-Fi. It's used a lot in VPNs, it's used a lot on network devices, so things like that. And in 2000, we start to see talk about HTTP. We see REST having its first presentation in 2000. So in 2002, SAML version 1 is created, and this is where we start to see, OK, single sign on the web matters. Now, I don't think SAML was the first one, but it was the one that kind of got interest from people. It was the one that had enough features where people said, yeah, actually, you know what, this actually could work for our systems. And in 2002 as well, at this point, Solaris then, or Sun, released their directory server as a competitor to OpenLDAP and to replace their NIST infrastructure. And now we're going to talk about, you know, what some people might consider the competition, but I have a lot of respect for this. Windows Server 2003. They released Active Directory as we know it today. It is hard to state how important this was in terms of identity management. Windows 2003 and the model that Active Directory had, where it had LDAP, and Kerberos DNS bound together in a domain with seamless login for all of the machines really change the way that we think about identity infrastructure as a business. It became the default. It is the gold standard. Almost every single AD release ever since is still based on that Server 2003 model and is just new layers of polish on top. This is probably one of the most influential products in the identity space of all time. You cannot go to a business without them having AD infrastructure. It's without a doubt. And what was also really important at this point is that Microsoft released Active Directory Federation services. And ADFS is their integrated single sign-on web portal that meshes with AD seamlessly. At this point, the idea of Kerberos as single sign-on had died. No one was going to use it. So what Microsoft did is they made it so that you could use Kerberos just to ADFS, only in that limited environment, and then ADFS would use SAML to everything else. And that's how they managed to bridge that gap and really make single sign-on happen with this release. So um, in 2005, SAML version 2 was created, and of course, this has since been added to the various um, ADFS and whatever else. And we also see in 2005, we're beginning to see multi-factor auth become a bit of a thing. HTTP was developed. Now, the RSA token had already existed for a while, but this is the first time we start to see an open source competitor to the RSA token. So a token with a hardware counter, you push the button, you get another one-time password. Great. Now, 2005, we start to see some more com competition in the, um, the web single sign-on space. OpenID is created by LiveJournal. I would never have picked LiveJournal as the one who created OpenID until I researched this, but apparently they are very influential in the web single sign-on space. Good work, LiveJournal. Uh, 2005, Red Hat open sources their acquired Netscape code, which is 389 directory server as well as Red Hat directory server. And in 2006, Google launches G Suite. Now, 
G Suite normally wouldn't be called into something like this, but this is one of the early times where we start to see a cloud provider requiring identity synchronization for you to access a service in the cloud. And this, is, this really matters because you need to be able to capture the password hashes in a certain way, synchronize them to Google so that you can actually provide email services via G Suite. I don't know the exact date where they started offering this sync tool, but I know that it was part of G Suite when I was administering it. 2006, SSH version 2 is released. And we also see OAuth beginning at Twitter. So um, yeah, Twitter actually invented OAuth, and then it's been revised ever since. 2007, Yubico was founded, and they originally made the little keys. Well, we've got them today, but the key was originally for emulating a keyboard, and it would type in a password, and they had their own one-time password algorithm, and, and they developed from that. 2008, free IPA version 1 was released. And this is basically Red Hat's answer to things like um, Active Directory, where they have LDAP and Kerberos glued together, they have a web UI for managing it, and it you know, has a nice domain join tool for their machines and offers Kerberos stuff and all of, all of whatever. But it was 2008 where that finally came out. In 2011, time-based one-time passwords were developed, and this is basically a security improvement over HTTP due to the counter recovery or something like that. And so you could, the, this was, you know, the predominant thing that's in like Google Authenticator or FreeOTP and things like that is, t is, is this standard. 2012, Auth version 2 was released. In 2013, the FIDO Alliance was formed. Now, the FIDO Alliance is a group of companies who are getting together and talking about and working on multi-factor authentication. So they are thinking about how can we all work together to make standards where we collaborate on getting multi-factor auth for our broad user base. 2013 was also another really interesting one. Touch ID was released by Apple. Now, this is probably the first time where we see a biometric auth released at scale and done arguably correctly. So in this case, what Apple does is they store a map of your fingerprint in a secure enclave as a coprocessor, and when you go to authenticate to the device, what happens is that the device requests the secure enclave to do an authentication. You then provide your fingerprint, the secure enclave does a match, and then it releases cryptographic material. It never actually transmits releases the fingerprint anywhere else. And this is a really important. This means that there's co security coprocessors now coming into devices. 2013 is where we see Ortho being founded, so that's identity as a service infrastructure. So business start to look at outsourcing their identity or approach it in different ways. And Ortho is very web first, they're very web based. And there are a number of others. I believe that um, we use one at SUSE or Okta, or, or I, I don't know the name, I think that's what it is. 2014, uh, Keycloak project begins. Uh, this is part of JBoss, and I think it gets acquired by Red Hat later on. And this is a web single sign on for um, open source. And arguably today, it is the only option if you want to use and deploy a single sign-on portal for web with open source technology. Unless you're willing to roll all the parts yourself in something like Django or Ruby yourself, this is the only one that just works out of the box. There was a, uh, an, the Ypsilon project, which was released for IPAv1, but for unknown reasons, that was cancelled pretty quickly. 2014, we see uh, a lot more movement toward cloud identity. Amazon releases their Active Directory instance in the cloud, and Azure also releases their AD synchronization tool. And this is really important. Remember what we said about Server 2003 and how it's everywhere? This matters. Azure releasing an AD sync tool is them offering a bridge from on-premise to cloud-based auth. And this is where we start to see people starting to offer these pathways to get to off-site authentication and doing that synchronization and replication that really matters. 2014 is also when U2F version 1 was released. Now, U2F is probably the first web-based web token, which does cryptographic auth. Uh, 2017, U2F version 2 was, however, then updated and uh, released by, by FIDO. And this is now what we would know of, and I'll talk more to this one, which is that it uses elliptic curve keys, and based on a, the, your domain name and a challenge provided, it will derive the key that you need to use and then sign the challenge and pass it back. So this is real cryptographic auth. This is much easier to use than something like X509. All you have to do is plug this key in, register to say, here is my public key, and that is it. No dealing with certs, no lifetime, no nothing. It really works very well. 2018 is when Windows Hello for Business was introduced. Now, Windows Hello for Business is really interesting because where th what this is, is this is where using a secure coprocessor on a Surface device, it will use your face to unlock that device, 
And then from that, it will perform a cryptographic challenge on your behalf and initialize your Kerberos token. This is Microsoft saying that for a majority of employees, there is no longer a password. This is where we start to see a big push towards devices as identity in, uh, in this space from Microsoft. 2019, Web Authentic is finalized by FIDO and the W3C, and really this is just the protocol about how we talk about U2F. It, it doesn't really change much the U2F standard, that's still <laughs> the same, but it does mean that there are now other devices which are included. I've, I'm the author of the Web Authentic libraries for Rust, and one of the things that, you know, having implemented that, I've seen is that as part of that standard, there is things in there for TPM-based authentication, there is some specific stuff for Google's Titan, there is Android-based authentication, there's U2F. There's multiple different types of cryptographic tokens that WebAuthn can negotiate and support as a, as a protocol. And what this means is that we're going to start to see a much larger proliferation of devices supported by WebAuthn for this kind of auth. So we're also here in 2019 listening to me give this talk today. Let's hope that maybe it's influential, maybe it won't be, I don't know. And in the future, we're looking towards some other interesting things. 2019, uh, we're expecting to hear from Apple that Touch ID will become a WebAuthn device. We know that they have, uh, in the iOS 13 beta, you can now plug YubiKeys into your iPad or iPhone and use them as a WebAuthn device. Um, and we know that some rumors that there is potentially a Apple auth service, but we don't know what shape that will look like. But whatever they release, it's going to be influential and it's going to you know, hit like a boulder in a swimming pool. There's going to be a lot of waves made from that. The other thing that's also really important here in 2019 is to, s is to point out that Windows Hello will likely also support WebAuthn. So what does this mean for open source? So there's a lot of history here, and you're probably sick of hearing me just rattle off dates and, and facts. Now, it, it's not coming up on the screen, but I've basically highlighted on the timeline the major points of what are the technologies that open source currently supports. And to list them off for you, the major player in open source IDM, if we're looking at it from a business deployment perspective, is FreeIPA. The latest technology it supports is from 2011 in TOTP and it's built on technologies from 1997 and, 1980 and 1993 in Kerberos V5 and LDAP. If you want to get web single sign-on, you need Keycloak from 2014, and Keycloak does not support WebAuthn today. So when we contrast this, since about 2011 to 2014, regardless of which way you want to put it, we are looking at at least eight years where we have not done a single thing there is nothing that open source has done in the identity management space. Nothing at all. We used to invent these standards. We were inventing all of these things. And now we're facing down against Microsoft who is going to be having faces unlock via Secure Enclave to do cryptographic auth. I can't even imagine where we would start with this in open source. We've been left behind. Like, what happened? What happened to us in the last five to 10 years? Like, we got absolutely blown away. Now, it's not for lack of smart people working in this area. We're just being left behind. But there must be reasons why. And I don't think that it's technical. It's community. Now, we don't have one. Even for me, joining the Red Hat directory server team, or 3 at 9, was like a, a major event. No one had joined that team in years. To have someone from the community actually get, translate into a job when I was at Red Hat, I'm formerly a Red Hat staff member, I'm now at SUSE, um, you know, that was crazy. Like, no one comes in and does drive-by commits in our projects. No one is doing this stuff in OpenLDAP. What is going on in our communities? And it doesn't take long to realize why we don't have a community. Now, we got destroyed really on two fronts. Number one was a, a focus on what we have. We were so obsessed with Active Directory 2003 that we wanted to reinvent it in 2008. It's about five years too late. And so we were so obsessed with making Active Directory happen. And FreeIPA is now, you know, they're trying to make it so that Windows machines can domain join, right, by adding global catalog and all this other stuff. Why are we so obsessed with this? We are so obsessed with what we have and obsessed with LDAP and obsessed with Kerberos that we can't see where the world is going. REST was introduced in 2000. 
People have been developing new web APIs for nearly two decades, and we are still stuck with these protocols. And what we are, what we, and, and we're not looking at what we could have been. And the other thing is that we have a lot of hostility in our community, right? And this is something that, as as a group, as a broader group, we are not addressing and we are not talking about. I think one of the reasons that I was actually quite nervous about giving this presentation is what I'm about to call out and the kind of standards of behavior, but also that, you know, the, the kind of backlash I could receive from people about talking about having a new competing product. So this actually concerned me, it was the whole source of anxiety about giving this talk. But we're talking about a community where, you know, from emails, you can't see it on the slide, I've highlighted the sections. On a, on a mailing list, someone said, you will be chided, mocked, and denigrated. There is such a thing as a stupid question. You will be publicly mocked and made unwelcome. This is entirely intentional and by design. I don't want you here. This is unacceptable behavior. This is not how you build a community, and this is not how you treat humans. And because of that, people walked away. No one wanted to be part of our communities. We lost our users, we lost our source of bug reports, we lost the people deploying the software who could tell us how to make it more usable and better, we lost the people who are integrating on desktop, we don't have any connection to humans outside of our small bubble where, who are using this software. We've burned every single bridge and now we are just gonna sit here and just keep building LDAP until we are irrelevant. It's not really a smart choice for our future, don't you think, given the way the world is going? Like, like I said, there are languages that don't even have LDAP libraries anymore. They don't even have ASN libraries. We can't even start to build them. That doesn't bode well. That's not where we want to be. So, after all of this, now I care a lot about identity management, and I care a lot about authentication and this whole space. I want these systems to be secure. I want them to be usable. I want people to be able to interact with them well. So, enough with the doom and gloom. I said, right, let's do something. What matters to people? What matters to our users? How, what, what do they need and what do they want? All right, so, so our users, the people who like you who are sitting in this room or the people in your homes who are your partners, family, all of these people, what do they want from an authentication system? All right, well, device authentication is a trend that we talked about. This is something we need to have. Passwords are bad. We need to get past passwords as our, our only source of authentication, right? We need to stop doing this. We need devices as part of our authentication system. People want self-service. People want to be able to log in when they're in a business or on a website, and they want to you know, be able to change their name at any time. They want to be able to change their address. They want to be able to do this. There's a lot of good reasons for this. Changing your name at any time. I worked at a business previously where you could not do this. And what that means is that there were women who, had, who were divorcing abusive husbands, and in their username was their abusive husband's last name. Every day, they had to log in with that name, and they were not allowed to change it. That's not acceptable. We have to have self-service where people can change their names, where people can do the things that matter to them, because these are situations that happen. Humans are in our tech stack, right? And the other thing is that people want to be able to audit their activity. You want to know when people are logging into your account and when there is suspicious activity. This is important. What matters to an admin? What matters to a business? Network authentication, radius. Now. If you've read the Google Beyond Court paper, really cool paper, wonderful vision of put all of your applications on the internet, secure them at that boundary. Totally un unachievable. Why? We all do not have Google security team. We don't have that many zeros on our budget, which means that we need to be able to draw a clear line in the sand of say, here is a delineation point, here is where we can say that there is, you know, people inside and outside, and then you know, that adds another barrier to people getting in. And we still harden the stuff inside, but we know that there is at least this many obstacles to getting there. Radius still matters. People are still deploying Wi-Fi auth, people still deploying VPNs. We need to support Radius. This is without a doubt. On-site and cloud, distribution. People are synchronizing identities to cloud. People are hosting their infrastructure in cloud. People are still doing stuff on-site. We need to be able to synchronize these two. This means things like read-only servers or other methods of synchronization. It needs to be highly available. It can't go down. I remember when the LDAP server went down once at one of my previous jobs, and the CIO was breathing down my neck saying, why? 
in less than five minutes, someone was behind me saying why, because that means email stops, the business stops, students can't do their work. It has to be high performance. We're talking millions of operations per second. We can't be you know, doing bad architectures in our software. It has to be fast. It has to have technical ordering events, which means that we are able to feed events into things like Splunk or Elk. This is where threat and risk management teams need to be getting their insights, and they're going to be doing data correlation and working out how that actually relates inside of a threat and inside of those areas. And it needs to be, it needs to be easy to administer. People do not want 3,000 knobs. You don't need to learn what the inside of the LDAP configuration should look like in order to set the thing up. This is ridiculous. People want to set up something and have it work. And we really need limited scope of access. This means things like claims or privilege identity management, whatever flavor you want to call it. The reason for this, Kerberos as a technology has done more damage than any other technology ever in existence. Why? Because it has no scoping to its credentials, which means if you get one credential, you can now pivot onto every machine in the business. If someone logged in as domain admin once on a Windows network, because that credential is unscoped, you now have the entire business. That's it. We need to have claims on our authentication. We need to have limiting of credentials and what you're doing, because this is the only way to prevent that kind of damage. So I asked myself, can open source do this? And thanks to the live stream, you're not going to get the amazing image of the scorecard that I drew, which is covered in red Xs. So basically, FreeIPA only has self-service, SSH management for, for that, and extensibility and simple multi-factor. That's it. It does not have read-only domain controllers. It supports radius, but not well. It doesn't have claims. It'll probably never support them. It doesn't have per-device passwords. It doesn't have things like, uh, it used to not be able to change your username, but I think it can now. But it has other representation issues in terms of first name, last name, which is not culturally aware. And it's never going to support WebAuthn. It doesn't have a web your API. It's not going to be able to do it. Samba 4 doesn't have self-service but it does do radius distribution thing. Like, you're going to get the hint. There's a lot of stuff that we just can't do. And I have to keep making excuses. Like, 389, we're developing a self-service portal at the moment, but that doesn't get us past the fact that we don't have multiple device passwords. We don't have a way of issuing claims. Like, you've got one password, that's it. Like, we can't ever add second factors of authentication to LDAP. It's LDAP. Like, the only way we can extend the auth protocol is by using SASL. And SASL stands for Simple Authentication Security Layer. It is none of those things. And, and so no one wants to work with SASL. I'm not going to add another 2FA mechanism to that. It's a dumpster fire, right? It's so hard to work with all these old tech. So we are bound by the fact that LDAP has a single password field and simple bind. This is not going to work with challenge response protocols like WebAuthn. So this meant that I had to come to the conclusion that we can't do this today. Right? And this is frustrating. This drives me insane because I work on 389. I wanted to make it better. And I, as, as much as energy as I put into it, I kept hitting barriers. And I really did want to make it fix these problems. And after all of this, I decided, no, I need to do something else. And that's why I decided it was time for something else. And this is why I started my own project. So, so far, what does the project have and what are we planning? Well, it's got a role-based access control design. This is Cunny DM. This is the new project. Uh, it has, I, I plan to offer PAN and NS switch clients with uh, offline auth for your, your Linux servers. I'd like to do pseudo rule distribution via them. Uh, because it's a HTTP-based API, it will natively and inbuilt support a OAuth or OIDC authentication portal. Uh, from day one, it's designed with highly concurrent system uh, and data structures. We're actually, I implemented the copy on write data structures for Rust and uh, there's a student in Brisbane who I'm mentoring who is further extending that to do copy on write um, maple trees, which is an extension of B plus trees. So we are doing highly concurrent designs from day one. There is no such thing as a mutex in our code because our data structures protect you and provide concurrency. We want to do things like account impersonation so that you can have better you know, support desk interactions. We want to do self-service UI with Wi-Fi enrollment and claims. One of the really cool ideas that I have is I want it so that every account can have multiple passwords for different things or different types of credentials. And you shouldn't have to handle them, right? You should be able to go into your account and say, I want to add a password for my Wi-Fi, and it will generate the password, and it shows up two QR codes, one for iPhone, one for Android. You scan it, and it will add the Wi-Fi. This is the kind of thing I want to do. 
what it means is when someone resets their password, they're no longer nuking their account on their phone because it keeps authenticating every five seconds and locking the account down. I've had to, de like everyone debugs this in a business. Why has no one solved it, right? It means that when someone compromises your Radius credential, they can't change your other account passwords. They can't read your private details, right? This is the kind of thing that we can start to do now that we start to have different credentials and different ways of interacting with them. And I really want to have synchronization to other IDM services. Like, I don't want to be left in a silo on my own. I want to be able to sync with other things. But what we will avoid is just as important. I don't want to add auditing. This is not my job. Splunk is much better at this. Elk is much better at this. We should be delivering logs that are fully structured, very rich in detail, that they can use and process, and then feed back things into us for analysis. This is not my job. There's a reason why free IPA dropped the A part. That's the auditing part. Fully synchronous behavior, already talked about this, high performance needed. I don't want to be a generic database. If you're a generic database, you have to handle every single use case. And that means that you can't have strong opinions about how you design and implement these systems. I'm making opinionated decisions. I can't be a generic database. And finally, I don't want to be LDAP, Cobros, or GSS API, and I certainly don't really want to integrate them. So when I throw this up on my scorecard, which again, you can't see, it makes me a bit more excited because while there's a lot of things in the planned areas, like we're planning a self-service portal, we're planning the replication system, like I've already started to take steps as to how we're going to do replication and distribution for multi-master asynchronous replication. Like we're planning the simple MFA. We've already got things in progress. Radius support, there's already some of the parts in place there and what we're developing to make that work. Um, SSH management claims, both have already got some of the handles in the database needed. I just need to finish wiring in how the access controls are going to look. So the access controls will actually respect the claims and, and things like this. So they're all going to interoperate nicely. And WebAuthn, there's a reason why I'm author of the WebAuthn libraries for Rust. I want to use it for this. What we already have today, though, is that we do have support for different device passwords. It is extensible, and we do do things properly in terms of allowing self-service and you know properly representing names and identities. So. Now you get to miss out on the most beautiful part where I give a video demonstration of my demo. So you will get to watch it later, but um, I'll talk to it for the stream. We can uh, set up a new server, takes one command, and you basically just say, uh, recover the account. And what that will do is that will initialize the database, and that will set up everything. It'll do your migrations, it'll add all the schema. And then what happens is, um, once you do that, uh, the video just failed, <laughs> so the stream's not getting it. Um, once you've initialized your account and you've set up that, you can run the server, you can go as a client, you can do a who am I as anonymous, and it will just show you what your details are, you do as administrator, and it will show you some more details, but it actually prompts you for a password this time because we can dynamically work out what credentials you need to provide based on your account configuration, and then finally, you know, it's already got all the access controls in place for showing like who's got what and, and you know, limiting scope of what you can see, what you can do. It has full referential integrity. It resolves all the UUIDs to names on the way out, so you never have to deal with UUIDs and references. Like, it's all very nice. So, let's get to the end. What about Free IPA? What about Samba? What about 389? Well, Free IPA is honestly trying to do the same thing in the same space. It is an opinionated identity management service, and you know, it is trying to fill a certain space. I am developing an opinionated identity management service trying to fill a very similar space. So in a way, I guess I'm competing with Free IPA. But at the moment, I really just want to run it at home, because this is the identity management service I always wanted to have when I was an admin. So whether it ever gets used outside of my house, I don't know. But I would like it to be, you know, have some more interest. What about Samba? Well, I don't want to have Windows client domain joining to my service. Because if I was to implement all of the support to have Windows domain join to KineDM, I would basically be reinventing Samba 4. And there are many more smarter people who have spent a lot of hours doing that already. It is a much better use of my time to write tools to synchronize identities between those two and let them do their unique specializations. Because we have support for multiple credentials, we can have, say, a Samba 4 credential which get fed to Samba 4, but is separate from your Cunny DM credentials. We can have, again, isolation and then funnel that in so that there's a limit to the scope of what is compromised in that case. And what about 389? Well, this is the one that pays my bills. 
So this is the one that I should probably care about. Well, 389, turns out, doesn't get used in a lot of identity management cases. 389 and LDAP servers are actually used as a high-performance distributed NoSQL database. 389 has ended up in a lot of really interesting places. There are finance institutions using it to store credit cards. They're using it to store all of their like account, bank account details. There are telcos who use it to store all the subscriber data. 389 is generally used as a high-performance database, and we will continue to do that. We will continue to develop the project, and we have things that we are innovating on and improving in this space. We are at a point where we're actually like seriously going to be contributing Rust probably in the next month to the code base. We are still improving it. We've done a lot of things in terms of address sanitization to, and, and testing and improvements there to make it better. But I think that it is a generic database, and we are limited by the LDAP protocol, which means that really the two will coexist. I think that 389 and Kani would coexist, and we probably have a synchronization tool. So for me, I think this is the future. I think that you know, we really need to start seeing some different approaches and different ideas when it comes to the identity management space. We need to you know, look at um, all of our users and the people we interact with and how we can give them secure experiences. And I really want to highlight here that what is so important is that your community and empathy are so key to building this kind of system. Not only in bringing people in and having a positive experience as a developer in an open source project, but also that without those attributes, you can't understand the needs of your users and you can't get that feedback and integrate it in a way that is so important to make a truly secure system. We really lost our community over time through hostility, and I really want to rebuild it through positivity and inclusion. So I'd like to thank you for listening to me ramble. I'm very sorry about the kerfuffle with the slides. Um, it turns out that at every other conference where I bring my Mac, it's all good, but this is the one where I have problems. So anyway, uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to hear them. My email is wbrown at suza.de, and even more importantly, I have LDAP server stickers, which is probably the nerdiest sticker you'll ever see, but I also have stickers for the new project. So if you want some stickers, uh, I'll give you stickers if you ask a question, or I'll give them to you in the corridor. <laughs> Thank you. Cool, no one wants stickers. All right, lunch. <laughs> yep, all right, morning tea then. Come and see me anytime. I'm always happy to talk about this stuff and always happy to chat. So thank you very much. For oh, here. Uh, I'll, I'll repeat the question. It's fine. He's, uh, the question was, is there more documentation than what's on the GitHub right now? The answer is, it's still under heavy development. That's what you're going to get. But it is easy to use. All of the command line parts are documented to at least what they can do. It's just that at the moment, there's a, it's like an iceberg. There's a whole bunch of server code underneath that I wanted functional first before I started really getting to the client tools. So there's a really deep test library that goes for all the way from the bottom up. So for our for like the back end part, you know, we can test individual like indexes, like the really raw, like adding and removing of database entries. We can do like query tests, we can do individual plugin tests, we can do like individual referential integrity tests, we can preload bad data into the back end and then see what happens when we search it. We've got like DB verification code, we've got all the referential integrity stuff. Like it's all been building up. And really before I started doing the clients, I wanted to have access controls and authentication in place. And those two things. You wouldn't believe the amount of things you've got to write to get those two things in place. Because if you want access controls, now you need to do referential integrity. You need to have member of. Now you need to have a certain amount of query support. You need to be able to support um, uh, a special type of syntax in the filter, which is for self-referentiation, so that you can do like queries where you say, I'm referencing myself, and so this access control can only do for yourself. In terms of doing auth, you need to have support for translating the entry into a certain way, storing the credentials, doing hashing. You've got to be able to verify that. You've got to be able to take it in. You need to have a protocol to do challenge response. You've got to be able to have certain events. You've got to be able to have a batch. That's why you don't see very much in terms of that. But because all of those low-level parts are in place, now is when we're starting to build up more in terms of the client tools. So a lot of the client tools you see, I actually wrote literally in the last two weeks while I was on the way here. And before that, we had nothing. So 
this stuff in terms of the documentation there will continue to improve. If you do want to have a look at this more seriously, like send me an email or come back in six months' time and I, I'm sure there'll be a much healthier and happier looking project there. So uh, that, that's probably why you're seeing what you're seeing. All right, cool. Thank you very much.